Last Sunday, we witnessed the most thrilling Starship test flight yet, and it was a resounding success in every way. SpaceX achieved what many thought was impossible, flawlessly catching the Super Heavy booster with the launch tower arms for the very first time. On top of that, Starship landed perfectly in its designated zone in the Indian Ocean, completing a spectacular suborbital mission. In today's video, we'll dive into the aftermath of this historic flight, from a post-flight condition of Booster 12 to the status of a launch pad infrastructure and ongoing post-flight procedures. After the successful recovery of Booster 12 with the help of the launch tower arms, SpaceX placed the vehicle back on the launch mount and immediately initiated procedures to secure it. The remaining propellants inside the booster were completely drained, and the quick disconnect mechanism was autonomously engaged without the need for technicians to inspect the booster beforehand. This move showcases SpaceX's confidence in the reliability and robustness of its systems. In the future, this automated approach will be crucial for the rapid refueling of the booster immediately after landing. Elon Musk explains that Super Heavy is designed for rapid reflight within one hour of liftoff. After launching, the booster typically returns to the ground in about five minutes. This leaves approximately 55 minutes for essential tasks such as stacking a ship on top of the booster and reloading propellant, facilitating quick turnarounds. On Monday morning, the flight termination system charges were safely disengaged and removed from Booster 12, and teams began preparing the vehicle for its return to the build site. The next day, the booster was gently lifted from the OLM and carefully placed onto the transport stand. Once the chopsticks were disconnected and lowered to their resting position, the booster began its journey back to the build site. The booster received an enthusiastic welcome from SpaceX employees, celebrating its successful recovery. The booster eventually went into the megabay for post-flight inspections and checks, a critical process that will unveil invaluable insights into its performance during the flight. These inspections will meticulously assess the structural integrity of the booster, analyzing any wear and tear that may have occurred during the flight. Evaluating system functionality will also be a key focus, allowing engineers to identify any anomalies or performance issues. A thorough examination of the booster that has successfully completed its mission and been recovered will enable engineers to pinpoint specific areas for improvement, leading to enhancements in design and materials for future boosters. Elon Musk confirmed that several of the booster's engines will be transported to SpaceX's McGregor test facility for rigorous analysis and testing, including possible static fire testing on test stands. Testing engines after they've been through a real-world flight offers unique benefits that ground tests alone can't provide. Pre-flight testing focuses on validating performance under ideal, controlled conditions. However, retesting and evaluating engines after a flight allow engineers to assess how they handle the full range of stresses experienced during the actual mission. It provides data on how components like turbine blades, combustion chambers, and nozzles endure high temperatures, vibration, and rapid pressure changes over time. Additionally, post-flight analysis can reveal early signs of wear, erosion, or thermal fatigue that may not manifest during ground-based static fires. This insight is invaluable for improving engine life, reliability, and reusability, ensuring future boosters can operate safely and efficiently across multiple missions. Now let's take a detailed look at the aftermath of Starship Flight 5. Despite the overall success of the mission, there were several noteworthy complications that SpaceX will need to address in future flight tests. As you can see from the booster landing video, a fire was observed at the booster's aft section, which continued to burn even after the catch by the launch tower arms. Fortunately, the fire did not interfere with the overall landing process. The fire seemed to originate around the raceway of the booster, near the quick disconnect ports. While it was extinguished after the catch, the exact cause remains uncertain. It's possible that residual propellant, combined with the high temperatures in that area, contributed to this flare-up. One of the chines, an aerodynamic surface attached to the side of the booster, was torn off during its return journey due to intense aerodynamic stresses. The stainless steel structure was completely ripped away due to extreme stresses, exposing the COPV inside. However, the issue did not cause any immediate or catastrophic failure, showing the resilience of the booster's overall design. In addition to structural damage, some of the outer engine nozzles were visibly warped due to the combined effects of intense heat and aerodynamic forces experienced during the return journey. A deformed engine bells highlight how extreme stress can alter the engine's physical structure. Fortunately, the outer engines weren't needed for the landing burn, so this defamation didn't interfere with the vehicle's descent. However, if similar damage had occurred to the inner engines, it could have compromised the landing attempt. 
This indicates that further enhancements in thermal protection and structural reinforcement are essential to ensure engine integrity during high-speed re-entry and future missions. A more concerning issue was the fire in the engine bay, which occurred during the return journey. The presence of fire in such a sensitive area points to potential leaks or insufficient thermal protection that needs to be fixed. Pieces of debris were observed falling from the engine bay after the booster's catch, indicating that some internal components had been damaged by the fire or high stress conditions. The launch tower arms experienced visible bending while catching the booster. This bending was expected due to the vehicle's immense mass, and it didn't impact the catch operation. Minor surface scratches were observed on the bumper pads of the arms at the points where the booster slid down during the catch. Fortunately, these pads are easily replaceable, posing no major concerns. A significant success of the flight was that both the booster and Starship quick disconnect mechanisms emerged unscathed after the launch. In previous test flights, these systems experienced damage and scorching, necessitating the replacement of critical components. However, improvements in the speed of the booster QD hood closure and the retraction of the Starship QD have proven effective. As for the launch pad and the launch mount, they withstood the forces of the liftoff with only minor surface charring, largely thanks to the water deluge system. Currently, SpaceX teams are working diligently on the pad infrastructures to address the minor issues encountered. Extensive welding activities were observed on the launch mount ring, focusing on repairing any damage. Engineers have been closely inspecting the launch tower, chopsticks, and associated systems to identify any other damage that might need fixing. With the fast pace SpaceX is known for, it's expected that the launch pad and systems will be ready for Flight 6 operations within one to two weeks. Starship Flight 6 will feature Super Heavy Booster 13 and Starship 31. Ship 31 has already completed its static fire testing and is currently inside the high bay undergoing processing. Scaffolding has been seen around the ship, indicating that teams are continuing tile replacement work. Just like Ship 30, Ship 31's heat shield tiles will be replaced with improved versions to ensure the vehicle can withstand the intense heat and stresses of atmospheric re-entry. Meanwhile, Booster 13 has successfully completed its cryogenic proof testing and is currently in the Mega Bay, where it is being prepared for its static fire test. The test will happen once ongoing repairs at the launch pad are completed and the site is ready for further operations. Given the current pace of preparations, Flight 6 is expected to take place by late November or early December. SpaceX already holds a license to launch five starships annually, as long as they follow the flight profile used in Flight 5, and do not introduce any significant changes to the vehicles. Also, the FAA has confirmed that all flight events during Flight 5 were within the scope of authorized activities, meaning no investigation will be conducted. This marks the first time a Starship flight test has avoided triggering an FAA investigation. With no investigation required and a valid license in place, SpaceX can proceed with Flight 6 without waiting for further FAA approval, assuming the mission mirrors Flight 5. Meanwhile, Flight 7 will require a new launch license, even if the mission is similar to Flight 5. This is because Flight 7 will feature Starship 33, the first Block 2 ship, which includes several design upgrades over Block 1 ships. Ship 33 has already been fully assembled inside Megabay 2. Teams are now finalizing plumbing and electrical systems as they prepare for the pre-launch test campaign. In addition, Ship 34, the successor to Ship 33, is also under assembly in Megabay 2. Recently, the forward dome section was joined with the already stacked nose cone payload bay, and the remaining sections of the vehicle will be stacked in the coming days. Now, let's discuss the latest updates from the world of science and technology. NASA's Europa Clipper mission to Jupiter's moon Europa was successfully launched aboard a SpaceX Falcon Heavy rocket from Launch Complex 39A at the Kennedy Space Center on October 14. This marked the Falcon Heavy's 11th mission and its second interplanetary flight after the Psyche mission to asteroid 16 Psyche in 2023. A little more than an hour after liftoff, the rocket's upper stage deployed the 6,000-kilogram Europa Clipper into an Earth escape trajectory. Shortly after deployment, the spacecraft made contact with ground control, confirming its health. It enfolded its solar panels, which span more than 100 feet, fully charged its batteries, and began its journey towards Jupiter. The spacecraft is equipped with 24 onboard thrusters designed for course correction maneuvers. It will use gravity assistance from Mars and Earth to optimize its trajectory and reduce fuel consumption, and is expected to arrive in Jupiter's orbit in April 2030. Europa Clipper is tasked with studying Jupiter's moon Europa, which is about 3,100 kilometers in diameter, slightly smaller than Earth's moon. 
Scientists believe Europa harbors a subsurface ocean beneath its icy crust, potentially containing more water than all of Earth's oceans combined. This ocean is a prime candidate for hosting extraterrestrial life, given the essential elements such as water, energy sources, and organic compounds that have likely persisted for billions of years. The spacecraft will conduct about 50 close flybys of Europa, with the first scientific observations planned for May 2031. Its primary scientific goals focus on three areas that will enhance our understanding of Europa. First, it aims to characterize the ice shell and ocean, measuring the ice's thickness and its interactions with the subsurface ocean. Through these observations, scientists hope to confirm the existence of liquid water beneath the surface and study how materials exchange between the ocean and the ice. Second, the mission will analyze Europa's surface and subsurface composition, seeking key chemical compounds that may support life. This data will provide crucial insights into the Moon's habitability. Lastly, Europa Clipper will investigate Europa's geological activity, studying ice movement, and detecting potential water plumes venting into space, offering deeper insights into Europa's dynamic environment. The spacecraft is equipped with nine state-of-the-art scientific instruments. These instruments will work together to create a comprehensive understanding of Europa's icy shell, subsurface ocean, magnetic fields, overall environment, and potential habitability. With an estimated mission cost of $5.2 billion, Europa Clipper ranks among NASA's most expensive science missions. After completing its scientific objectives in 2034, NASA plans to crash the spacecraft into Ganymede, another moon of Jupiter, to avoid any potential contamination of celestial bodies that could hobble life. Following this mission, there are discussions about future endeavors aimed at further exploration of Europa. One such mission is the proposed Europa Lander, which would be launched in 2027 to complement the studies by the Europa Clipper and perform analyses on site. Thank you for tuning in for the latest science news and Starship updates. If you enjoyed this video, please hit the like button, leave the comment, and share it with your friends. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications so you never miss an episode.